All right, this is going to continue our series on taking notes in your Bible, and we're going to pick back up in the book of Revelation. And I've already done a verse by verse through the entire book of Revelation, but for this series, I wanted to do start out with the book of Revelation because that just is what gets people interested in the Bible. That's just how it is. So that's the one I started out with. So starting in verse 11, it says, Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So it says, What thou seest, write in a book. So the, God's telling John, What thou seest, write in a book. John is literally picked up, carried forward in time, without a time machine, without a flux capacitor, without anything from the movies that they use to go forward in time. And he sees things. He saw it with his own two eyes. And if he was in the Old Testament, uh, he, he might have been called a seer because that's what they called the, a prophet, a seer, many times. So he sees things with his own two eyes. If seeing is believing, then John definitely believed. But John had faith and sight. He, he, did, he had both. What thou seest, and you'll see that the Old Testament prophets, a lot of them, saw things with their own two eyes. For example, Habakkuk 1.1. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. Habakkuk saw some things, was shown some things by God. Ezekiel was picked up by the locks of his hair and carried forward. He saw some things that nobody saw. Then Revelation 22.8, another good verse about the Apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation. And it says, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. So John saw the things of the book of Revelation, and he heard the things of the book of Revelation. Can you imagine? Can you imagine trying to go to sleep at night after you just saw what John saw when he wrote the book of Revelation? There's no way in this world you'd be able to go to sleep unless you had the peace of God like John. So John is on the Isle of Patmos, but he's carried forward in time. This is God's version, I guess, of an outer body experience, and the devil wants to counterfeit that. So, it says, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book. So, God is about using men to write things, and everything God tells men to write is perfect. As Peter says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And Job the book of Job 19.23, it says, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. And they were printed in a book. God wants men to write things. I still think God wants men to write things, to edify the saints. John 21.25, it says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. And there were things that John was shown that he didn't even write. I'm sure that if he wrote down everything that he saw, the world couldn't contain the books. But what he's seeing, he's told to write in a book. Jeremiah 5160, Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that should come upon Babylon. Even all these words that are written against Babylon. So Jeremiah wrote in a book. You see, God tells men to write things, to communicate to people through words. Ephesus, let's look at what these church name means. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Not getting too much into them, we'll, we'll get into them later more. Right now, let's just write down what the name means. Ephesus means fully purposed. Smyrna means myrrh. Pergamos means much marriage. Sardis means red ones. Thyatira, odor of affliction. Philadelphia, brotherly love. Laodicea, civil rights. 
Now these, a little bit more on them, these seven churches can go in so many different directions. They got so many different applica applications. Historically, these were literal churches during John's day, back then. Practically, we can learn valuable lessons for us today just by reading these about these churches. Prophetically, they represent churches in the tribulation, and each church can represent a certain time in church history, the most well-known probably being the one we're in now, that people believe we're in now, which is Laodicea. All right, now verse 12, moving on to verse 12. It says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Okay, the only, really the only thing I looked at on this verse was the candlesticks. And what are these candlesticks? It says it in the same chapter. If you look down at verse 20, it says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So the seven golden candlesticks, it just plainly tells you, are the seven churches. All right, verse 13. And in the midst... Of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. So who's the Son of Man? Just go to Matthew twenty four thirty, and it tells you who the Son of Man is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. So this garment, let's look at this garment. Revelation nineteen thirteen through 16 gives you a good description. It says, and he, ate, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. This garment is going to be dipped in blood. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We're also going to have on white garments. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So on this garment you have the words, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's what's on this garment. That the Lord Jesus Christ has. And he's clothed with a garment down to the foot. And it says he's girt about. That's like clothed about. And girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Okay, the paps, that's like his chest area. Okay, so son of man, the Lord Jesus Christ, his garment. We've seen the garment. Now look at verse 14. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Now this is Jesus Christ in his glorified body. This isn't how Jesus looked when he was walking around on earth. To get a description on that, look at Song of Solomon, which says his hair is black and bushy. It says, you know, he has dove's eyes. Here, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And you'll notice a lot of this is going to match what Daniel says. In Daniel 7, 9 through 11, is the verses I have wrote down here. This is describing the Lord Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment. And it says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow. So there's that garment again. And the hair of his head, like the pure wool, matching Revelation 14, which says his head and his hairs were white like wool. So his head and, his, his head, and the hair of his head, like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Those wheels is probably the same wheels that you see with the cherubim in Ezekiel 1. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. There's those books again. God loves books. Uh, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld, to, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So this, 
this is showing you the, the great white throne judgment and also leads many people to believe that the great white throne judgment doesn't take place after the millennium but right after the second coming because here it has the beast slain destroyed and given to the burning flame which matches what happens at the end of the book of revelation when jesus christ comes back but um, we're never going to know all these things perfectly until we get to heaven. But it's led many people to believe that. Um, but there in Daniel 7, 9 through 11, you have the Lord's glorified body described, which matches what verse 14 said in Revelation chapter 1. Now let's look at eyes, his eyes. His eyes were as a flame of fire, it says in Revelation 1, 14. And if you look at Daniel again in Daniel 10.6, it says his body also is like the barrel and his face is the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. This is very similar to what we're reading in Revelation 1, 14, 15 and 16 here. Okay, verse 15 and his feet like unto fine brass. Once again, that'll match Daniel 10.6. His feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. And, and Jesus has been in a furnace. In Daniel 3.23 through 25, that's when the, the three Hebrew boys were put in the fiery furnace and the Lord Jesus Christ was in there with him. So, so no wonder it's, it's as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice has the sound of many waters. Let's look at the voice. Once again, Daniel 10, 6, another great verse for this. The voice of his words, like the voice of a multitude. Imagine hearing the Lord's voice, and you're going to hear it one day. It's going to say, come up hither at the rapture. You're going to hear the Lord's voice. It may wake you up out of your sleep. It may call you up while you're at work or when you're just sitting around doing nothing. That's why you want to be doing something. Maybe the Lord will call you up when you're doing something for Him. Jeremiah 10, 13 says, When He uttereth His voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and He causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the wind out of His treasures. Revelation 14, 2, And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Revelation 19, 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. So, the Bible describes a lot about the Lord's voice. There it's describing the people's voice in heaven. It describes what the wings of the cherubim sound like. They sound like the voice of God. It's, they sound like many waters. So the voices of people are described a lot in the Bible. God's voice is described. And it sounds like many waters. But that's just been a quick little... Uh, note. look at note taking in the book of Revelation and probably next time we'll finish up chapter 1 so it really didn't take that long and I mean if you wrote all this down then you already have tons of notes in your Bible I mean I've not counted how many references I have wrote down but it's a lot 